Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Torero. A um, lot to think about, a lot to discuss, and I'm delighted to say that we have a, a, a learned panel uh, who are ready to join us uh, to, to discuss just that. Uh, as they come up and join us uh, on the stage, uh, I, I might remark that, um, if you would please, gentlemen, take your seats. Um, I might remark that uh, there are more than a few people in this room, I think, certainly there are several people in this room who will have smiled wryly at your uh, account of the uh, World Food Programme deal uh, falling apart at the WTO. Um, it's not uncommon, as we all know, in international negotiations. I recall many years ago during the Irish peace process, this was a common feature uh, that uh, you, uh, there would apparently be a big deal and then it all seemed to fall apart and you'd meet one of the negotiators afterwards late at night sitting in a hotel room somewhere and uh, she'd pour herself a really strong whiskey and you'd say, what just happened? Uh, and the reply invariably would be, the rats got at the bag of oats. And I think this is a, a common problem with uh, international negotiations that uh, invariably um, there's, there's many a slip twixt uh, cup and lip. Um, we're going, joined now uh, by our panel of experts. The format is that they will, each of them, give us about two minutes of a response uh, to what we've already heard. Um, and then my aim is to finish just after um, eight o'clock uh, for those of you rushing for a bus. Uh, we have a, about 25 minutes uh, for open discussion, uh, well, for discussion. We'll have two minutes each from the, uh, from the panellists, and then we'll, uh, we'll open it to the floor. Our panellists are Anna, uh, Alan Renwick, uh, Professor of Agriculture and Food Economics at UCD. Um, he played a very important role in Scotland, advising uh, Scottish policymakers, uh, when, uh, where he was head of the land economy and environment research group at the Scottish Agricultural College in Edinburgh. That's now uh, Scotland's rural college. It's been combined into uh, something that almost looks like Chagask, it seems to me, but maybe I'm misinterpreting it. Um, Jerry Boyle, you will all know, uh, who's uh, director of uh, Chagask and has been since uh, 2007. He's Emeritus Professor of Economics at the NUI Maynooth, and he's a former head of the economics department there. Uh, he holds an adjunct professorship at the University of Missouri, and he was previously a senior research officer with the Agricultural Institute, and he was also an economist uh, at the Central Bank. So uh, Jerry brings a great deal of uh, experience uh, to bear on this subject. And uh, we also have Aidan O'Driscoll, who's Assistant Secretary General uh, for Agriculture, uh, EU Affairs, and uh, the Common Agricultural Policy at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. Um, Al Aidan is, is, would be well known to many people, including a lot of journalists. He reminds me that we first met back in the 1970s in UCD. Uh, I, I know he was studying hard because of where he is today. I can only assume, though, that we met in the bar because that's the only place I was ever in in UCD. Um, so I think, if I may, I'll call first on Alan Renwick. Thank you, Leo, and uh, thank you, Maximo, for a fascinating, uh, I think it's a real tour de force of the issues um, surrounding uh, the global governance, and I, I feel slightly inferior uh, coming to, to respond to such a, a great talk. I, I mean, at the end, I guess I've got a couple of minutes. There's a few questions I think probably I, I would raise to you. Um, one of the areas that immediately I have this sort of default mode now, which is whenever I'm not quite sure what to talk about, I, get, I revert to power in agriculture and global power and this idea about concentration in the markets. And Maximo touched on the issue about input markets, but I think there's equally an issue with output markets and very few companies controlling our global food supply. And we still seem to be talking very much about countries, and you were talking about the portion of exports from America, Brazil, which is fine, but really it's not countries that export, it's companies. And it's these companies that have a huge amount of control over food supply. And you touched on the issue that uh, in, Aus in Australia, um, they seem keen to discuss the issue of promoting competition. And I think there are real um, challenges for us 
in terms of a global governance of competition policy because we have obviously domestic competition policies and we're trying to domestically govern com companies that are working in 100, country, com 100 countries or even more. So we're trying to have a, a domestic governance of competition when it really is so important at, at the global um, level. And I guess following on from this, I mean, uh, Jerry and I were in Paris last, last week. It was a romantic trip, I think, uh, for us. Uh, we, were, we were at an Agriculture Economic Society conference, and there were some very interesting plenary sessions there. And I think some of these touch, touch on some of these issues. There was one organized by the OECD and FAO working together, which I think you'd like to see in this. But there does seem to be some disagreement. You were talking about promoting um, policies that promote improved productivity. And there does seem to be some disagreement um, on this. And Will Martin was there. I think you mentioned some of his work. And he very much focused on it's got to be research and development. For every dollar you put into research and development, you get 10 back. For every dollar, I think he said, you put into input subsidies, you get 0.8 of a dollar back, was one of the quotes he had. But there seemed to be a lot of discussion around, actually, can you use price support in uh, developing countries to try and boost production now. And there's a lot of contention over that. Clearly, we've tried to move away from that within Europe. Um, but is, is this an actual initial boost? So I think I'd just be interested in your views. You, you mentioned these policies and, and what you feel um, these policies uh, should, should be about. And I mean, I guess there's an interesting question about you mentioned the issue about um, the World Bank on one hand and the IMF on the others with different objectives. I was also interested in how these other, you know, the OECD are working with the FAO and others in AMIS and things. And I was just interested in your view how trying to f bring these, these different institutions together to try and create this global governance structure, how um, well you think that's working and what are, what are the challenges there. So really there's just three or four things there that came to my mind. I also have to say thank you for the slides of the crane. I have, I have a son whose favourite book is called The Little Yellow Digger and the little yellow digger got stuck so he got a bigger digger. Now he's going to be obsessed with the crane and getting a bigger crane to solve the problem. So, so thank you for that anyway. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, we'll get a response after all the uh, speakers have had a chance to uh, have their say. Uh, just to say, we're, we're getting some messages on Twitter. One query uh, from Neve Cairns was just, uh, uh, would the video be available? Uh, and of course, yes, there will be a video of this event uh, on the website. Uh, the hashtag is uh, hash Chagusk, uh, for anyone who is tweeting in the room and who wants to follow the discussion on Twitter. There's been a, a fair bit of activity uh, during the evening. Uh, okay, I'll call now on uh, Jerry Boyle. Thanks, uh, thanks Leo, and uh, thanks, uh, Maximo. Um, there's a huge amount in, in this paper, so I, I'm only going to touch on a, a few issues that um, I found particularly interesting. I mean, one of the, the basic points that I'd like your view on is in relation to uh, the uh, likely trajectory of real food prices. I mean, one of the first things we learn in agricultural economics is that for well over a century, real prices, despite short-term volatility, are on a downward trajectory. Um, there is some debate, at least, as to whether that has reversed and whether there has been a structural shift and I'd be interested in, in your perspective on that, given your your research, um, the excessive research, amount of research you've done on that. Um, I, I found your discussion about um, the problem, uh, the reaction of governments in 2007, 2009, very interesting, because uh, I, I do recollect uh, that was, uh, I joined Chagas in, uh, in October of 2007, and for the previous uh, 12 months or more, I actually worked with the World Bank in, uh, in Moldova. And this, it was a fascinating experience. And I'm not sure whether um, all of the aspects of why governments behave as they do have been captured. Because dare I say it, and I tend to be a quantitative person myself, but I think uh, political economy is very important. I remember discussing with the Minister for Agriculture in Moldova 
uh, uh, with my colleagues in the World Bank pointing out that the worst possible response to a price hike was export restrictions. And he could not understand why we did not see his perspective, which was really a political issue. Now, they did go on to make an absolute hash of the policy response in all sorts of ways. I think that they implemented pretty much everything that you said they shouldn't do. They tried to control the price of flour. They tried to, they banned uh, exports and so forth, and it led to smuggling and everything else. Every sort of a conceivable catastrophe that you would have predicted uh, ensued. But I'd be interested if I went back there today as to, to, to whether they had learned anything. Because I do think there's a very, very interesting issue for me when you interface with politicians in these matters, um, is that there seems to be a tendency to, for, for a collective uh, amnesia when it comes to um, policy matters. And when markets recover and things get back onto an even keel, as you say, it's even more difficult in that environment to get people and policymakers to think in, in, in the way that I think you correctly advocate, they also think about, uh, I think the figures that you present there are quite extraordinary, that uh, I think in, in the, some of the simulations you present suggest that the policies more than double the problem in terms of um, relative price increases. But I do think there's, a, there's, there's something going on there, I think, which is probably, uh, as I say, relies on the realm of political economy more than um, uh, the, the normative economic response. I liked your, your discussion of volatility. I think the emphasis on defining very clearly what we mean by, I would dare to even say volatility uh, itself, is, is certainly in this country, has various, uh, uh, there's various understandings of it, let alone excessive volatility. I, I, I absolutely believe that it's very, very important that we get our definitions absolutely clear. And, and that is not always the case at all. Or even when we talk about risk and responding to risk, I think we need an awful lot of clarity there. And I think your, your paper was uh, you know, very, very helpful in that respect. Um, I think um, you presented some very interesting uh, stats in relation to medium-term developments. I think the biofuels one is something that certainly we've noticed here. Uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting trend because we thought that curve was going to go upward. I think your discussion on climate change was very interesting. I think you're essentially saying that even on a global basis the jury is out. There are certainly huge regional differences and that's something that as far as this country is concerned I think we would agree with as well that certainly it's impossible in our, um, at our latitudes to extract the signal from the noise. That's, that's, uh, that's a, admittedly a local point, but I think it fits in with your point about the, the huge variance in model results. Um, I would agree with you in regard to your, uh, your catalogue of, of um, the medium and long-term vulnerabilities. Um, Water is, is something that, that comes up in all of these discussions. And obviously, again, we look at this from a, a parochial point of view, and we are, our, our concern is very much with water quality. But one issue that really concerns me in a lot of the development literature it relates to irrigation. And, and this goes to the heart, again, of the political economy difficulties that confront governments. Particularly, I'm thinking now, mainly in my, I have a lot of experience of Eastern Europe and Central Asia in these matters, where they had massive irrigation infrastructures prior to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And of course, the presumption on the part of the politicians, even 10, 20 years on from, from uh, independence, is that that's the optimum. The difficult issue for a lot of these governments is to actually face up to the fact that they need to downsize their irrigation infrastructure. And that's a very difficult political thing to do. And to sell that to your population, where they have seen crops growing and so forth uh, due to um, being aided by irrigation, to, to say to them, look, there's an irrational level of irrigation, and it needs to be downsized. And you need to prioritize. And of course, this is an inter-country issue. I mean, in some cases, it might be better, as we know. And these are the difficult issues uh, 
it might be better for some countries to actually substantially downsize their, their irrigation infrastructure. Um, so really what, what uh, I just wanted to say was that, in, in, by way of conclusion, I think there's, there's much in what you recommend that I absolutely agree with. Uh, the importance of insurance policies and so forth. I mean, I think rationally uh, that's all very, very clear. The uh, deficiencies you see in input subsidies and so on. And by the way, just as a matter of uh, local historical interest, in the programme for economic expansion here in, in Ireland in the late 1950s, the single most important agricultural policy was a fertiliser subsidy. So the attachment to fertiliser subsidy goes a long way back. Um, of course, it's effectively the same as an output subsidy. It's just in a different way, and it, does, uh, it doesn't have sustainability. Finally, of course, being a director of Chagas, naturally I would say I would absolutely agree with you in regard to the importance of investment in R&D. But again, if you look at developing countries, and this is something that really worries me, and this goes to the heart of the institutional point you make, which is very well taken, the problem in a lot of developing countries that are investing substantially in research infrastructure is that the institutional structure is very, very weak. That, for example, there is a, a disconnect between dissemination of knowledge, communication of knowledge, and the conduct of research. And that's an institutional problem. And it's a very serious problem in countries like Pakistan and India and in some African countries as well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Boyle. And then our final commentator, as it were, is uh, Aidan O'Driscoll. Thank you, Leo. And you haven't changed at all since the 1970s, I must say. Maybe, maybe even less here. Um, uh, first of all, I should say that uh, Maximo is from, from um, IFPRI, which is a, a, a body which the Irish government strongly supports and has consistently over the years through my colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs. And the reason that the government has strongly supported IFPRI is because of the quality of work it produces uh, consistently. And as a consumer of the product of IFPRI for a very long time, uh, I'm not at all surprised to see the quality of the work that we see reflected here today. But thanks, Maximo, for that. Um, I just want to reflect very briefly on some of the uh, institutional challenges because um, uh, Tom Arnold is here and he and I served back in 2008 on the... Uh, Hunger Task Force um, uh, here in Ireland. Um, and that task force made a, a valiant effort to boil some very, very complex issues around global hunger and so on down to three issues. And the three issues we stressed were the need to improve smallholder productivity, and um, Maximo has, has touched on that, uh, the need to, to focus on maternal and infant nutrition, and Maximo mentioned the Sun Initiative, in which Ireland has played a significant role. Um, and the third issue that we identified at that time was the need for a focus on governance, which is the theme uh, uh, today. And our point was uh, that we felt it was necessary to create the, the, the political will uh, to take the actions needed to deal with um, uh, gl global hunger and uh, nutritional uh, issues, and to put in place the institutional architecture to ensure that commitments made by governments were actually fulfilled. Uh, I, I, I'll come back to that point in, in just a moment. Um, now, a, a lot of progress has been made in, on some of these issues. Um, the institutional issue, the, the issue of nutrition, for example, which we described as an institutional orphan, is now something more of an institutional adoptee, has, having been taken on board through the SUN program and others, and now referenced uh, by FAO and WHO and, and all the various bodies. Um, some progress has been made on smallholder productivity in many parts of the world, but the area where we've made least progress is, is on the institutional question. The idea of putting in place some strong mechanism uh, that can actually focus our global efforts in this area, both in dealing with volatility and dealing with uh, the longer term problem of, of hunger. There has been some progress, and I, I, I suppose surprised that Maxim perhaps didn't reference it, and that is in the reform of the Committee on World Food Security, which is the primary intergovernmental uh, forum uh, housed in FAO, but independently existing, 
uh, for dealing with issues of, of global uh, hunger uh, and also the primary uh, in international uh, uh, forum for the interaction of governments with civil society and uh, the private sector. And the reform of the CFS in 2009 has uh, strengthened it significantly, has improved the quality of the information coming to it through a panel of experts, including supplied by the likes of, of IFPRI, the World Bank, FAO and, and others, uh, and also improved its engagement with civil society and, and the private sector. So when I see the G20 initiatives that uh, Maximo uh, put up on the screen, I, I, I think it's wonderful that we see this level of engagement with these issues. But as a veteran of three world food summits, um, I also uh, can't help being a little bit weary uh, at seeing commitments that we have seen before, frankly, uh, and wondering how will they be held to account if we don't have a strong institutional architecture uh, uh, to do so. I believe the Committee on World Food Security and institutions like that is what we should build upon. So yes, I, I know that with Amos, for example, that the Rapid Response Forum was set up, but why a separate forum? You know, Why have we done that? Uh, it's a great idea to have a Rapid Response Forum. Why don't we build it into the CFS, Committee on World Food Security? Why multiply uh, these initiatives and increase the level of incoherence in the system is, is something that would worry me, and I'd be interested in your response to that. Let me take another example, which is the whole issue of climate change, which Maximo also mentioned. Um, we believe, uh, the Irish government believes, that we need uh, a joined up international response to the uh, challenges of climate change and food security. Um, and we've actually been banging on about this uh, quite strongly in, in a whole variety of places for some time. Um, up to uh, very recently, uh, in both EU and UN uh, circles, the issues of climate change and the challenge of sustainably increasing food production to meet the glo global, global world population, a 50% increase by 2030, much greater by, by 2050, has, have been dealt with separately, astonishingly. You know, these two things that interact so much, that are so interconnected, have been dealt with separately. So we were delighted to see uh, a small few paragraphs in the recent uh, Commission white paper uh, on um, climate policy to 2030, which talked about the need to join up these two issues. And, and we credit ourselves with some of the, uh, of some of the kudos for that. At UNFCC level, uh, that is uh, the, the UN uh, process for, for negotiation on, on climate change, it's been a, a, a much slower push. Uh, again, uh, there we have sought uh, what is called a work program on agriculture, that is to say a, a specific mechanism to address agriculture within the climate change negotiations. We still haven't got there. Uh, and uh, at the most recent meeting uh, where there was a push to get this, it was actually the large developing countries who pulled the plug uh, because of fears about what the uh, conclusions might be. So we have a huge set of institutional challenges uh, in this area. And um, uh, it is good to see uh, the, the, the Chagas series actually identifying it uh, and putting it here as one of the issues. If I have time, I just want to just say a few words also in relation to some of the policy issues that Maximo uh, identified. I'll just concentrate on, on, on one or two. First of all, on the input subsidies uh, issue, uh, which you mentioned and you referenced Malawi. And I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in your, your thinking on this, because we all know that one of the great challenges here is to increase our productivity and resilience in agriculture in, in Africa. I mean, the average yields in, in, in Africa are about a little over a tonne per hectare. Um, it is very easy to double that or treble it. And this has been done. I mean, this is not, this is not uh, fanciful. It's quite easy to do this and has been done in several parts of Africa and in other countries. Um, the question is the role of input subsidies. It worked in Malawi temporarily. It wasn't fiscally sustainable, but then uh, what is in Africa given their, their, their fiscal weakness? Um, it's very interesting to me to see uh, input subsidies come back on the, on the agenda. When I, uh, I worked in Africa during the high point of structural adjustment programs, when, when the mere mention of, of this kind of thing would be absolute anathema. 
And I, I see it, it's interesting to see it coming back on the on the agenda. You say it should be targeted, temporary, and smart. Well. I think we'd all agree with that, uh, but what does that mean precisely, and uh, what role do you see for those? Uh, you mentioned post-harvest losses, also a very important issue, as we know, 30% loss to, to post-harvest losses. We've been supporting FAO work uh, in that area, um, but it's a slow push, surprisingly enough, uh, because in a lot of cases, the kind of uh, um, things you need to do, the, the improved storage facilities and so on that are needed on farm in developing countries are relatively simple and cheap. Um, so we could, we could uh, achieve an enormous amount in that area if we had the will to do so. And finally, one final point is on your, your mention of grain reserves. And IFPRI has been identified uh, as certainly pushing that issue in the recent past. Uh, I thought physical grain reserves was what IFPRI were, were advocating. And my real question there is in relation to WFP and the fact that there are already mechanisms through WFP. For example, uh, Ireland, uh, my, my department contributes about 10 million a year to WFP and uh, Irish Aid contributes about 8 to 10 million as well, uh, all in cash, all with the uh, instruction that WFP should use the money to uh, the, the best possible use and, and buy the product uh, at the best possible price. Uh, but within WFP, we contribute also to a thing called the Immediate Response Account, unfortunately known by its acronym, the IRA. Um, um, so uh, it, it um, does, you know, I think you could make a case that it is a virtual grain reserve, that it acts there, it, it stands, and is, 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 can be rapidly deployed. Is that not the way to go? Uh, in, in operating grain reserves and linking that to another WFP initiative which is the Purchase for Progress initiative that I'm sure you're familiar with which is designed to then use that funding to actually support smallholder agriculture and their integration into markets. But overall, Max, I just want to thank you again for an excellent presentation, really, really good and very, very stimulating. Thank you. Thanks uh, very Thanks very much indeed, Aidan. I, I was happy to let our speakers go on a little longer because uh, they really had important things to say and I felt we, we should hear them. I will allow about 10 minutes uh, for questions, but I, I'll give Maximo a chance uh, maybe just to respond as quickly as you can to the broad range of, of issues uh, that were raised. If you prefer to just stay see seating, there's a microphone there in front of you. Like All ah, right, okay, yes. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 I so thank you so much for, for, for the comments, and I won't be able to answer them unless you want to stay until 10 p.m. I am more than happy to, to continue. My plane leaves tomorrow, so I can't be the whole night here. Um, uh, okay, so the first question or comment was on how to promote competition. That's a really complex issue. Uh, at a country level, of course, you can create policies at the country level that allows you, and we have a lot of experience in telecommunications, cellular phones, for example, and so on, although they are still oligopolistic. But at the global level, uh, which is the issue that we are looking here, so you are correct that the countries are not the one exporting, they're using traders, but the countries have access to mechanisms to sell. So for me, if, if the exports are, are concentrated at the country level and the chocks are geographically targeted, like climate chocks, then that's what worries me. Because if one country produces everything that is exported, then the chock will affect. But if I look at the traders over that layer, then the concentration even goes higher. Now, there is not too much you can do, my, my, at least my, my learning experience uh, for the last seven years uh, was that it's very complex to coordinate countries. Uh, and one of the things I learned by sitting in all the meetings of the G20 was that, which it has to be approved by consensus, that one country can mess up everything and you never get into an agreement. Uh, and that's typically the case. So the way is how to create incentives for the market to react to increase that competition. One thing that we try is the fertilizer industry, okay? Because it's completely right what you were saying before that I, the yields in Africa are so low and the, and the level of access to fertilizer is extremely low. So the amount of fertilizer I use relative to a developed country is like one fifth or one sixth of what you should be using. But when we look at, at the global structure of the market, and for example, I increase one plant of fertilizer production based in Nigeria, and look at what will be the change in prices with estimating elasticity and so on and so forth. The effect was significant. That doesn't mean that I don't have a problem at the country level. So assume that I build my plan in Nigeria of fertilizers, I will increase my competition in 10 or 15% of the bigger producers of fertilizers, 
That will, of course, reduce my price, and it will improve the access. But in addition to that, I could have a problem at the country level. The value chain at the country level won't work properly, and there could be some groups that will concentrate most of the structure. But my, my point is, I cannot resolve the problem at the country level without looking at the global problem. Because I can resolve, and, and my country can be as efficient as possible in the value chain of fertilizers within the country, but the inputs are imported. And those inputs are highly concentrated. Therefore, I will be paying a price that I cannot access to. Okay, so they have to go together. It's not only the, the country, but also the global. And that, I think, is the major issue with the Malawi, with the Malawi experience. Now, the objectives of, of many of the UN agencies, in, in, and sometimes including IFPRI and other agencies, between the World Bank and IMF that are to bring the parallel with poverty and inequality, the OECD, FAO, because AMIS are all the international organization. It's not only OECD, FAO, it's hosted in FAO. Uh, they have different objectives, but what we learned, at least with the Paris G20, that was a very nice process of trying to bring all the IOs, international organizations, together and try to figure out how we can work together. That, that for me, was a very costly learning exercise, but was a great exercise. The sad problem was that after Mexico, that went down significantly. And today, basically, there are two or three IOs which still are working in the G20 process, but not all of them anymore together. And that's where the individual incentives start to play a role. So that's a part of institutional design. Do we need so many UN agencies together? We should reduce them and target them properly. Today, with the reform of FAO, they are basically doing exactly what the World Bank does. The strategic plans, the strategic objectives that they have right now include poverty alleviation, include transfers, include nutrition, includes production, includes infrastructure, includes everything. And the World Bank is also going through a reform. So, so we need to be careful, I think, and we need to be more, held these institutions more accountable of what their mission was and what they are supposed to be doing and delivering so that we can make the system more efficient. Uh, and, and the division of labor each day is worst. Everybody is doing everything today. That's why I mentioned the example of the IMF. They are also doing poor inequality. Uh, and that creates a lot of overlaps and inefficiencies that we need to, to, to try to, to simplify. Now, in terms of the, of the, uh, uh, the sport restrictions and, and, and the complexity to convince countries, I have been in that situation. We were able to convince Tanzania to avoid a, a, an export ban. We were able to convince Ethiopia uh, to not to increase their food reserves in, from 900,000 to 3 million tons. But that creates a lot of trust building and a lot of evidence to bring brought to them. And the way you present the evidence, and especially the trust. Uh, and then you can start creating changes uh, and start to influence them. But the problem to me is that it's very difficult if I am a ministry today of agriculture, and I want to see what are the best practices, and look at the evidence very quickly. It's very difficult for me to find it. Even if I go to the IFPRI webpage, I will struggle a lot to get what I want. So, so I think we need to improve the, the public good uh, and to put it in a place that people will know. And that's something that we are losing, how, how we can share more information so that countries can learn. But it takes time, but I think it can be done. Uh, we have done it in, in several cases. Uh, uh, for example, right now in Peru, we are prioritizing all the investment of public expenditures with a methodology which is very transparent. Uh, so we, I think it can be done. The, the issue of the, of the negative economies of scale of significant iteration, I think, is very important, and that's something that, that needs to be looked. And again, is the prioritization. I have been in designs of, of prioritization of irrigation projects where there were significant demands which didn't match even the potential of the land. So if I'm going to put an irrigation project where there is no water underground and where the land doesn't have any capacity to grow and to improve to the maximum potential, it doesn't make any sense to do the investment. And normally, we don't take into account those criteria when we do these public investment projects. And we forget that this is public money. The same applies with R&D. And I completely agree. We just finished a huge review of all the interventions of extension and ICTs, information communication technology. So use of ICTs for extension, which there are tons of interventions. And we don't find one that has a significant impact. OK? So there is a huge gap on, on quality of extension that we need to look at it. And that's something to, to be worked. I completely agree with the CFS, although the complexity of the organization of the CFS to be inclusive also creates a significant transaction cost, which makes more difficult a thing like the rapid response form to be there, because we need to respond in 24 hours. So that creates a little bit of, of the difficulty. And just to finish, one last thing is that we forget, normally, when we do investments, 
of the concept of compacts. Okay? It doesn't make any sense for me to give an input subsidy, increased productivity, if this farmer doesn't have a better access to markets. So I need to look at the whole value chain and see how I can create the demand for that. And that's the typical case that we fail. We give something, but we don't resolve the problem. I have a very nice example for, for Latin America, where the country decided to invest in a road so that farmers can move high value commodities faster. So they invest $100 million and they reduce the transportation costs in three hours to export these commodities. But when they arrive to the port, it takes three days for them to move out of the port. So all the investment was useless because the, co the commodity completely deteriorates uh, 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 and we lose. Uh, and the last thing is the stocks. Uh, IFPRI was pushing for uh, humanitarian reserves, which is different to buffer stocks. And the concept of, of virtual reserves, which I was involved directly on that, was a very different concept. And you are right, it's being implemented. The, the regional reserve that, that was developed for ECOWAS had that concept behind, and WFP is supposed to use the, the virtual concept of buying rights to, to, to food rather than to have the physical commodity because you lost uh, on that. What we are concerned is buffer stocks. Uh, and that's where we have collected a lot of evidence of how it has created problems, and especially that you don't have the institutional, developing countries don't have the institutional capacity to, to, host, to handle those. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed, uh, Maximo. So uh, I'm going to allow 10 minutes uh, for, for discussion. I know that uh, people will have to leave, and we do understand that. We're running just a little bit uh, behind, but uh, ah, sure, it's a nice evening. We'll, uh, we'll continue on. Uh, one person who did have to leave, I noticed him uh, had to, uh, having to go out, was Dennis Nocton, TD, who was the Fine Gael spokesman on agriculture for quite a few years, as I recall. Uh, he's now uh, an independent. Uh, but Dennis has been tweeting uh, the conference and particularly was struck by uh, the comment that um, that access to water would be key by 2050 in regions with 52% of the population and 45% of food production. And that, of course, as we heard, without uh, the impact of climate. So uh, just to acknowledge that uh, Dennis Nocton was here and clearly would like to have contributed, but uh, he's uh, done so by tweet. And we are getting a few more tweets as well, uh, including, um, I, as far as I notice, uh, several students of Alan Renwick from uh, his day is day in Edinburgh, actually, as I notice. Uh, OK, so uh, we'll open it to the floor. Is, does anyone want to chip in with a comment or a, an observation or a question? We've got a question over here. Uh, if you just wait for the microphone for the video, you'll be famous. <laughs> great, great. Um, no, I just wanted to uh, take up the theme that Aidan raised there about the disconnect between the um, climate change and uh, food security, food productivity. If you uh, look at the dire predictions in relation to the effect of climate change, a negative on uh, food production, and how much that is going to uh, disimprove in the coming period up to uh, 2050, um, and particularly how it's going to adversely affect uh, the southern hemisphere, Africa and uh, South America, uh, it seems really that a piece that hasn't been addressed at all is the, um, the retailing of cheap food in the Northern Hemisphere and the uh, overconsumption and uh, food waste uh, that we have. Uh, and I don't know how that can be addressed, but I think that's also part of the, uh, of the uh, step that needs to be taken. Does anyone want to pick up on that or can I move on to another? Contributor, maybe. Let, let's take a few comments and then we'll we'll wrap them into uh, responses. There's a gentleman at the back of the room there. Sorry, I, my I new glasses, so I'm not seeing so well. <laughs> it's possibly a comment, but just uh, it concerns me always at these sort of forums that um, uh, the issue of the human capacity on the land gets well. I'm not saying it's lost or not referred to, but it certainly seems to be uh, in the shadows. Um, and if we're talking about production of food security. The ability of people to do the job comes to uh, would be something I feel we're, we're just not focusing enough on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else want to offer a, an observation? Okay, if, if you would mind waiting for the microphone just so to Sorry. help the people um, online. Is, is anybody looking at the problem of how um, politically uh, to ensure that the population of the world remains a manageable size. All right, that's... <laughs> 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 
All right, does anyone want to handle that? <laughs> um, so, Massimo, would you like, Maximo, would you like to um, make an observation on those comments? And I'd certainly take any comments from the other members of the panel. Uh, okay, so, so a few comments. Uh, for, I forgot to answer about the real prices. Uh, in our simulations, the trend is, is positive. The, the problem is the, the, volati the volatility, but not excessive, no? as I mentioned before. Uh, okay, so um, in terms of the controlling of population, <laughs> my, my previous president tried to do that and he's in prison right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Fujimori. <laughs> um, so I, I think, uh, again, it's an issue of information asymmetry. It's not an issue of imposition, which is what my previous president tried to do. Uh, it's an issue of how you inform people in the best way. Uh, what we're trying to do in IFPRI, at least, we have a program called Happy Faces, and it's working with kids in the school, uh, providing the best possible information uh, so that they can make their own decisions. Uh, which doesn't mean that we impose anything, we just, uh, we just provide the information. So I think it's just an issue of reducing the symmetry of access to things. Uh, uh, but I was really surprised, at least in Latin America, to see how that has improved lately uh, significantly. And that's something to, that, that from where we can, we can learn. Uh, um, in terms of human capital, uh, again, that's a critical point. Uh, if you look at all the economic literature uh, on labor economics, 98% uh, will be urban labor economics and very small percentage in rural labor economics. Uh, uh, and that's a very important missing gap. IFPRI has a new program on, on rural labor markets because it's not only uh, work on, on the plots and the skills to learn the plots, it's also gender inclusion uh, because the technology not necessarily fits uh, the gender. Uh, and also uh, minorities, of course, inclusion of minorities. Uh, so we have a program that we're trying to look at value chains and trying to get quantitative measures on how to understand segmentation and segregation in the labor market and related to skills and what are the wages paid to those skills because that's where discrimination uh, uh, could happen. In terms of food waste, which is also another question by the panel and also now, uh, we did a study for, for, the, for the UK in which we look at the waste on retail in the developed economies, in OECD economies. If I am not wrong, was around 30%, which is equivalent to the average waste in developing economies in production part. And that means that if you reduce that 30%, you have a lot of more food available. Uh, and that's because of standards. And the problem with the standards is that they are international set, but they are not necessarily country level set. So you have significant issues of food safety at the country level, regional level in Africa or Latin America, because they don't have standards, even the minimum health standards uh, at the national side, like aflatoxins, which is a problem. So again, uh, so it's not just an issue of developing countries. I think it's an issue of developed countries. I, I have a very nice, so we're trying to work on policies. And what I observe, one nice policy is that if you go to a restaurant and you leave food, you are charged a tax. Uh, that's Asian. Uh, uh, so for example, sushi restaurants, when you go and you buy these rolls of sushi, they will charge you for the amount of rolls that you left so that you don't over over order and, and therefore waste uh, the food you're doing. So uh, there are a lot of initiatives uh, around that and how to, 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 to improve on that. Just, um, I'd like to again uh, make the point in relation to human capacity to agree with M Maximo on that. Um, one of the things that um, I think, though, it is important is how you, uh, the structures in regard to education and training are very, very important. I mean, uh, I'm impressed, certainly, from what I've read, um, uh, the role of farmer field schools in uh, enabling peer learning, for example. I mean, one thing you find, and uh, it's uh, Theodore Schultz said it, you know, uh, uh, you can be poor but efficient. So in other words, uh, I mean, people can be quite receptive to new technologies. It's not that they necessarily have a knowledge gap. Sometimes the knowledge gap is on the part of the uh, observer. OK, we've, we have a, a comment on Twitter uh, from Niall McCarthy, um, who's picking up again, I think, similar to what we heard uh, from, uh, from the floor. Uh, he's, he's picked up strongly, Alan, on your comment about companies, not countries. Uh, controlling food supply. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that and whether that, whether you think that feeds into the, the comment that we heard from the floor about I mean, I think food wastage? I think that uh, uh, Maximo highlighted the issue about inputs, but I perhaps he didn't talk so much about outputs and the control of, of the markets there and its likely impact. And I think that that is important. And I think um, 
it is something we need to grapple with uh, and, and deal with. But I think it also relates to this issue that if you have this sort of global concentration, perhaps comes back to the human capacity, how do smallholders engage in these global chains? And I think that's something that's uh, occupying OECD and others, others at the moment. How do you make these huge global chains receptive to smallholder production so that they can benefit from the, those gains? I think that's a real challenge for us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I promised. Uh, I, I promised to. Uh, do we have one one person offering at the back? Yep, we can certainly take one last comment uh, before we uh, before we finish up. Yeah, one last comment. I guess there's a few lads here who want to head for a pint. Um, <laughs> Just, just, to, just to follow up on a few of the issues, uh, Trevor Donlan from Chagask that have been raised on the uh, the population growth issue. Uh, I'm like the Wizard of Oz here. If you, if you, if you go into Twitter or, or sorry, go into YouTube and and look up this guy Hans Rosling, he has some very interesting lectures on this issue. And basically, to summarise, his conclusion is that the population growth will top out at around uh, 28 or 2090 at around. 13 billion people. So we kind of have an answer uh, to that one. Uh, and a comment also on the food waste issue. Um, you know, it, it, the storyline is very much that it's the rich people of the world that uh, waste a lot of food. There's a lot of food loss uh, lost in the um, production process in the developing world. But what will happen when the people of the developing world uh, um, move to the point where they have income levels like we have now, will they start to waste food as well in the way that we are? And uh, are we ultimately underestimating the food requirements that the developing world will have? Well, I might, if, Aidan, would you like to take that as a final comment? Uh, because you, you have a lot of experience in Africa as well as well, your uh, policy. I, I mean, I, th I think the, the key thing about the food waste is, uh, as Maximo correctly says, it's, it's around a 30% loss in both developing and developed countries, just coincidentally, but very, very different losses. So in developing countries, it's mainly losses in terms of on-farm storage and loss to pests and so on. And as I was saying in my remarks, this is solvable. I mean, there, there are cheap and effective uh, storage systems that have been developed for uh, application in African countries and so on. And, and it is very, very important to roll that out. In terms of the food losses in developed countries, in fact, there are uh, campaigns going on in this country um, to try to uh, encourage people to reduce the food waste that we have here and in other um, EU countries also. The problem is, a lot of the food waste, as Maximo says, is at retail level, but quite a bit of it is in our domestic kitchens. Uh, it's, it, we just buy excessively, uh, we waste excessively, we allow things to go out of date, we've all done this. Uh, and this is a tremendous uh, waste and a tremendous cost on the system because this is product that we are buying, it's demand we are creating. So it is very important indeed, I think, uh, to get that under control. Um, and just finally, on the population issue, since Trevor has touched on it and, and Roy asked about it, um, you know, it is absolutely key and uh, it is part of this, this whole picture, the need to uh, address uh, the issue of, of population growth in, in developing countries. But again, there's a lot of policy rollout in developing countries to try to, uh, not as radical as the Chinese approach, uh, but to try to, to address this. But certainly uh, access to uh, birth control and, and so on is, is a key part of all of this. Um, as we all know, there is a kind of Z pattern in population growth. In other words, as people get wealthier, they have less children, essentially. Uh, but the problem is in the intervening period, uh, when they're still poor, have very, very large numbers of children and so on, it adds significantly uh, to the uh, a burden on many things, but also on food systems. And we, need, we do, in fact, need to address that uh, coherently as well. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, my thanks to your patience. I'm sorry we overran a little bit, but uh, I felt it was worth uh, worth doing so. Uh, my thanks to the to the panel. 
Uh, I'll now call on Tom Curley uh, from the RDS to, as it were, propose a vote of thanks to the, uh, to the speaker. Tom will be known to people from all parishes here, I think, uh, between the RDS, where he's co-chair of the, or vice chair of the Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee, but also he would be known to everybody in Chagas and, of course, Gertha as well. So. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, look, I'm not going to delay people. I think we've had a fascinating evening here. I think uh, Maximum I think it's a fabulous lecture. And our three panellists certainly complimented the lecture and did a wonderful job. Um, this doesn't happen by accident. And just I'd like to briefly thank some of the people who were involved in organising it. Lance O'Brien, I think, and Frank O'Mara from Chagas, I think, were the key people behind it. I'm sure supported and led by Jerry Boyle. But the uh, people behind the scenes, too, uh, did a lot of work here, Hilary and Phil, and I think Jane tonight was, did an awful lot of work here behind the scenes to make it sure it happened. And in the RDS, I think Paul Farrell has been the main person involved. This is the fifth lecture of a six lecture series, I gather. And I suppose um, the, uh, uh, I think it's been an outstanding series. I've been at all the lectures here, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Uh, I suppose to address the challenges, not just facing the agriculture and food sector, which we probably tend to concentrate on a lot, but also the challenges facing humanity itself. I think it's important to put our challenges into context. They are challenges facing humanity. Uh, and uh, I think the issues around population control and population growth and uh, climate change are part of that context as well. I think it's important that a lot of people here are in leadership positions. And I think it's important that real leadership is provided in terms of tackling these issues, not hiding under maybe politically acceptable, you know, fudges and addressing the real issues that are out there. Um, could I just move the suggestion, Frank, that I think it's been a fabulous lecture series, and I think maybe when it's over mid-year, whenever it's, it's, it's the last, last lecture is, that it would be worthwhile sitting down and digesting the complex messages we've had here over the last two years on these massive subjects. I think a, a digest of the kind of conclusions and interactions would be fascinating and of value to an awful lot of people. So just to thank everybody involved and you, our moderator, and on behalf of the RDS, say that look, we're delighted to be involved in, in, in helping support this series here uh, through the venue and that, and uh, certainly we look forward to seeing you at the last lecture later this year. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, and indeed the, there are plans afoot uh, to address exactly that point of having some sort of a uh, summary on the night uh, of our last uh, talk, which uh, I just the date, it's in June, but I. July, Gomeleshkel, July, um, middle of July, but we'll, we'll obviously keep a, an eye on the website. In the meantime, Garamila Maigwiv Galair, August, Slán Awalia.